I wanted to say something uh, while we're waiting about um, preface to the first edition. And uh, the very last paragraph, uh, Korzybski says, his heaviest obligation was to his wife, the former Mira Edgerly. And he says a lot of nice things about her. Um, on eBay, I came across a, uh, a first edition that I think is it's signed by Korzybski and Mira. Uh, like November, I think it was published in October of 33. And I have the signed copy from November of 33. I thought it was interesting, but it's signed by her as well, which I thought was cool. I imagine she probably made some contribution to the work if um, often unacknowledged in those days. Yeah. Is that if this interesting? Book proves of any value, Mira is in fact more to be thanked than, than the author. Without her interest, no non Aristotelian system nor theory of sanity would have been produced in 1933. Yeah. My kind of guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's pretty complicated. I mean, if you're interested in the life of Mira and uh, Alfred, Bruce uh, Kodish in his Krasipski biography covers that. Uh, in depth based yeah. on personal letters and stuff and it's it's pretty complicated well it was his book that inspired me to get a first edition because he goes into how carefully korzybski like even chose like the paper and the font you know he yeah. chose the paper specifically and i thought it was interesting so when i came across the first edition i was like oh that sounds cool i'll get that was there a premium for it for their signatures say again was there a premium because it was signed? Um, I mean, yeah, it was more than a regular amount. Yeah, it was a right. couple hundred dollars, though, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And I, just before we start recording, hi, everyone. I just hi. want to show you something I got from an estate sale in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And this was from the home of um, Fred and Usinger, and I don't know his wife's name, but he started this sausage company. Um, <laughs> and it's says... Yeah. I just got you that. Sure did. Thanks, Jackie. Just got that. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Milwaukee, so. Oh, cool. Anyway, it says behind every success. It's a trivet. Yeah. Kitchen. It says behind every successful man stands a woman telling him that he's wrong. Oh, that's good. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Well, on that note, I think we'll start the recording. Recording in progress. And uh, start our yeah. session. Uh, so welcome back uh, to those of you that were with us last time and welcome for the first time to those of you that are joining us for the first time. I had a nice lively session uh, one week ago, and uh, we certainly, uh, that session covered all the front matter, which is quite a lot. Uh, and uh, if there's anything from that uh, reading that uh, we anyone wants to bring up, we can certainly uh, talk about that as well today, tonight. Um, but otherwise, um, we're starting with uh, Mad Haven. With uh, part one, I'm gonna, uh, and uh, and with uh, which really is still kind of working on introducing the book, uh, sometimes repeatedly. But uh, uh, anyway. Um, so that's Scott, or is it? It looks like you're seating off camera. That's I'm, I'm doing both. Okay, so Lance, sorry, I wasn't here last time. So if you've covered both of these questions, then you can maybe skip them. But I got two questions from the introductory material. Question one What's the difference between neurosemantic and neurolinguistic? And question number two 
there's a lot of talking about races. And I was hoping he meant the human race versus animals, but unfortunately, in some of the preparatory material, he's specific about white races. So I'm just curious. I saw in, in your introduction, you did kind of say, well, you know, stuff was a long time ago. So any thoughts about either one of those questions? Well, I mean, I'll start with the second one that uh, I th I think that when he's talking about the white race, I mean, you know, he's obviously talking in a very dated kind of language. And, uh, you know, we might, you know, if we want to be generous about it, we could translate it to Western civilization, which is, you know, or European, you know, Euro uh, kind of centric civilization and that he's um at least not sure about applying it beyond that or doesn't feel like he knows enough to apply it uh past that but uh but i think you know that basically you know in the language of this time you know they'll talk about race the way we would talk about culture uh, uh, i'm sorry someone seems to be talking over you i want to hear what you're saying um can you let's see here um looking for who's anyone who's someone talking about Monty Python. I'm just uh going around muting people. Um because, so you were saying that you thought it was Western European, because it does have something in there against racial prejudice at the very beginning. So I don't right. think you know Yeah, I think he's you know we could translate it as Western civilization or Western culture. Um and that he's unsure about making claims beyond that. Um, but I, I, you know, th that that's the way I, I would, gen you know, to be generous about it would be to translate it, you know, in, in that sense. Um, and and again, I mean, people were talking in those in that way back back then. Um, but uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, you know part of it is that he includes his knowledge of languages is limited to a hand, several i mean very impressive for us americans who know very little but just several um indo-european languages and not beyond that uh, okay then about neurosemantic and neurolinguistic how are they yeah. different yeah someone's I, definitely coming over at least mine yeah um well i why don't i i and I, I could answer that but i mean I'll, I'll see if someone else wants to to tackle that like um he does say he does actually say in there that he doesn't um, he doesn't know any other races. He can only speak for himself. Okay. I mean, okay. he does say that. Yeah, I mean, it really comes off very badly to the you know contemporary ear and eye, but uh, let's not you know. I mean, that's. I was just asking the question. I wasn't necessarily. Right. Yeah. I, I just think just a couple of things here on Scott's. Uh, anybody who's not speaking, it's you can mute your mic, you know, to get feedback. Uh, the, I think the point about the neurosemantic and neurolinguistic is that, you know, they're obviously highly related, but there does seem to be a difference in the way that people can identify with the meaning of a sentence and or a statement versus the way like cultural values can be shaping in a like biased or a like we call it ethnocentric way like people's dietary practices sexual practices you know these are they're they're largely um neurosemantic reaction loaded that is people get a visceral like this is food and that's not food and why does this culture eat this and it's it's more than linguistic but you also find that same phenomena just in linguistic realms okay thank thank you Corey, but i'm still not quite sure i understand if there's a distinction between the two because he quite he normally uses them right together quite often yeah. in the same sentence well if I may, I could uh, elucidate that a little more, if that's okay. Please. Yeah. Well, the first thing, maybe not to confuse, I would at least substitute Brzezinski's later term is uh, evaluational reaction, let's say, and just drop the word semantic. So to look at evaluational reaction and neuro-linguistic and neuro-evaluational, 
well, the neuro comes as his first focus is that don't propose to consider language without a nervous system. There's no language without a human nervous system because, you know, it, the papers don't matter unless a person's reading it. People have to have nervous systems if they're alive. And the neuro evaluational, again, evaluational has to do with our entire reaction to words and language and other symbols and whether we breathe or cough or consider everything that goes on within our skin is considered a um, evaluational reaction. And the neuro, again, implies if you're going to change it, if you're going to have it, if you're going to consider somebody else, nothing without at least the nervous system, but of course, much, much, much more than a nervous system, but at least that much. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, just to that, I mean, it's, it's absolutely that, you know, these things don't exist except, you know, it's to acknowledge the biological component and, and semantic is not just language as the others point out. It's, it's all of our symbol systems, but also just perception itself is covered on, is included under the semantic. Uh, Tiffany. This got me, when I was reading, I was thinking back to what Corey brought up last week, and I'm trying to, to reconcile it to make sense. So when he does the pretend slapping of his student, I, yeah, yeah, it's, it was, it still resonates with me because it is very odd, but, you know, Corey brought up well, how, or well, I should say what I interpreted as Corey bringing up was how could he, with all of his background, not anticipate that his students would have that automatic reaction. So we have the trigger, then we have, you know, a, an actual bodily reaction. So I, I don't yet understand enough. Like I, I've been trying to understand for him, there's a stimulus and there's a response and that equals the reaction. But I mean, for him, the actual visceral response sometimes is primary, right? So wouldn't that take wouldn't it be expected that his students would then have that actual shocked visceral response to seeing a female student slapped? Yeah, that, that's the neurosemantic environment right there. I mean, they've been conditioned by their culture to see that and to jump to conclusions about what that was. And he, of course, he knew that they were going to react that way. That's why he did that as an illustration. But then he wanted to say that they didn't really have the right context. They didn't have all the facts. They they went in a kind of intentional way rather than an extensional way, and they didn't follow up with what was going on. Now, when Jackie last week brought this up and we sort of chased it around, I mean, what I was trying to say was this, and this is what Gregory Bateson's disagreement with Korzybski was. So I know this is a little technical, but I mean, Korzybski says – if you have rigorous enough training, you can delay your your semantic reactions in order to have more sanity. And Lance then brought up the interesting example of like science fiction, where these people, you know, this sort of dystopic worlds where people have been able to completely purge anything like a, a non-delayed reaction or whatever. And that's not dystopic, by the way. That's, okay. that's <laughs> that's a a utopian. Whatever, you know, let's talk about stuff. But I mean, I think the point that Bateson was trying to say was that. In movies, you know, when we experience dreams or when we experience movies or when we go to plays, what we want is the ability to get lost in those. That is, without the ability to identify, you'd never cry at a movie. You'd never cry at music. You'd never really be emotionally moved. Instead, you'd go, oh, look at little pixelated lights that are up there on the screen. I'm, I'm abstracting and treating them as if they're somehow real events. So, I mean, there's a, there's a sense in which the whole realm of fiction cuts against a lot of the, the arguments that Korzybski's make, at least for Bateson's perspective. Well, he also made the distinction between overt and visible aspects of these evaluational reactions and internal. Like, Corey, I agree with you. That, and I forgot who was just asking that question. I'm sorry. Tiffany. Tiffany, that the internal, let's say, visceral responses are not controllable much. They they happen, but if you're sitting in a chair, perhaps, and you're experiencing them, but you're not throwing a book or making uh, you know overt actions or taking actions, 
that'll put you, as say, in a more flexible position to consider what's going on here. I'm in a class. I know what this guy's up to. I know what he's trying to do. And I wouldn't mind holding my breath or jumping. That, like you said, can't be avoided. But what are you going to do about it? Could you at least wait a bit before you uh, take external actions that might have other consequences other than inside yourself? Well, you know, I think it goes back to the at least the idea that of not making assumptions and checking things out. And, uh, you know, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me and uh, but I don't know if that really makes an ass out of people if they're if they get, uh, you know, uh, upset about seeing seeing Korzybski slap his uh, his student even as a pretend kind of kind of thing. So, I mean, it, it, it does seem a little odd as an example, but, uh, I mean, there are plenty of other examples to, uh, well, Jeff, why doesn't it seem odd to you? No, I was agreeing with, with you. Uh, oh. he, he, in my opinion, he just asked too much and went too far. He has some great other examples that are much right. different yeah. than that. They, like I was saying, I mean, everybody puts their, usually, everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time, including old Alfred. I mean, he is not innocent of lots of stuff. Perhaps he wishes he didn't say later in life, but so it goes. It's good yeah. for us to consider that, that uh, he lived and died and drank and did everything else that everybody else did, no matter how far he went in his system and his formulations and everything else. But his life was full of stuff people in Charlotte Reed and others just didn't want to talk about yeah <laughs> yeah you know it does remind me of the I, something we're seeing more recently where teacher a teacher will have a prearranged uh thing with a student where the where the teacher uh, kind of scolds and punishes or a student for doing something that they didn't do um you know accuses them of doing something that that it's obviously they were not doing and uh and, you know, sends them to the principal or something, and no one in the class says anything. And then the teacher um, then turns and say, and uses that as as an example of how people sort of kowtow to authority and just accept in, injustice. You know, where they, you know, may pay lip service to protest and standing up to things, but don't actually do that. So it just seems like a similar kind of, you know, exercise in how people respond to things that you know to to this sort of thing um scott do you have have something on on this uh no, I'm, I'm sorry no my i hit the wrong button i apologize oh man. okay watch that button um eleni you are muted uh hello everybody um I have something different to say because uh, it's the first time I, I read uh, Korzybski. So it's it was very interesting for me, uh, the relation with psychoanalysis and neurosciences. And uh, the first time I, uh, I read his writings because I've heard of him, but never read what he wrote. Uh, what I found exceptionally interesting is his idea of um, denial of definitions of things, which is the contrast with Aristotle and what we've learned, um, because especially uh, in Greece, we, we've learned uh, Aristotle's definitions on tragedy, for instance, we have to learn it by heart and, you know, uh, and I think this, it's um, an agony of our society and has always been how to define things, who you are and, the ease thing. Uh, so I find it very interesting, his denial of ease and that he starts from what the things are not. And um, I find it very interesting, uh, especially uh, relating uh, to art, because in art, uh, even in uh, 
music or in uh, visual arts or even in writing, what is very important is what we call negative space, what is not there. And I think what is, is important is what, what is not there. That's what you get and that how you relate it with art, basically. So that's what my point is. <laughs> that's great. Um, you know, on, on the point about definition, uh, you know, I would point out, I mean, this comes up in IA Richards uh, as well. And, uh, and Neil Postman writes, wrote about this uh, several times. And, uh, and it's this whole idea that we're taught from when we're young to learn what is the definition of a term and that that is utter nonsense and yes, everything the definition of everything we have the need but, to do. but the thing is the definition is the problem as opposed to a definition because mm. there is no definitive source of definitions you know you could say what is the definition of tragedy what is aristotle's definition of tragedy or what is Eleni's definition of tragedy um, you know, it's the thing is in the dictionary is that nobody signs their name to the definition because, you know, if it, if it were signed, you know, definition by Lance Strait, then they would say, oh, it's that crazy guy, you know, from the, from the IGS and, uh, you know, you wouldn't take it that seriously. Um, I, my old colleague Ed Wachtel made the point that there's almost an inverse relationship between author, authorship and an authority that when they're when it's not named it takes on this godlike authority like you know in a sense a lot of the bible is just not authored you know at least in its anonymous right. yes. but it's not it, but it's sort of you know that that make makes it authoritative or in an encyclopedia the entries usually have an author at the very end but when we're kids especially we don't really notice that we just sort of pass by that or back when we had newspapers, you know, which you're all old enough to remember that. And there would be a byline, but we would tend to, you know, we wouldn't pay much attention to it. We'd just read it as if it were an, an authority. But, you know, with definitions that there is never a single definition and and it's never there's never no such thing as a right definition because it's just a human creation. I think we didn't this come up last time. I think we I, I thought I had said this last time um, that, uh, you know, in, in a class, uh, we were ta talking about media ecology, and I mentioned that there are all these different definitions of media, and and one of the students said, well, how do you know which one is is the one, right one? And I said, well, you know, if you think of it as a tool, a definition is a tool, how do you know which tool to use, mm, yes, you know, okay. which one works, you know? Um, the uh, the negative point I think is interesting um, as well. A negative space was um, very significant for Marshall McLuhan on an, on another side of things. The the things that aren't there. And for Bateson, Corey mentions Gregory Bateson. I mean, Bateson writes about how in the symbolic realm, it's the letter you don't send or the taxes you don't file. Um, the things you don't do have meaning that. Um, they don't elsewhere. I don't know, Corey, if you want to talk to the neg negation. I, again, I, I appreciate it. I, I do think that is, I, I agree with Eleni that, that that's one of the more interesting parts of this early section is that what he grounds it all and what he says is what this fundamental principle of non-identity where he says, whatever I say a thing is, it is not. And I think that's, this is where he, it's almost like you can see more explicitly the connections between Buddhism and uh, Korzybski's project. I mean, it's kind of like disabusing the mind to think that what you could say would be things rather than you're just an animal chattering noises. And oftentimes you take those abstractions too seriously. Right. Um, Laura, you. Hi, everyone. Well, I have uh, several questions about uh, several concepts or words. And maybe it will sound like very basic, but I need to understand what uh, Korsivsky means with with these uh, words 
So I don't know if you can help me to understand. The first one is uh, non-elementarist. I don't understand what means what what is the the meaning about this uh, uh, this phrase uh, or this concept. Uh, the other one is multi-ordinal terms, and especially how um, how can we apply uh, uh, Koshibsky um wrote about the the word yes like an ex example but i don't i don't understand how how can be applied and the last one is uh semantic aphasia okay. i don't understand that one thank you okay so the first one is non-elementalism would someone like to tackle that Um, well, so, yeah, I'd be willing to do that if it's sure. okay. Sure, go ahead. By the way, can you tilt your camera down a bit so you don't want to see the top of me? Yeah, it, or yeah, it just seems a little disconcerting when we have like when, eyes without a face or whatever. All right, how's that? Great. Well, I guess from a definitional point of view, before we get into how it works operationally from a definitional point of view, non-elementalistic applies to certain terms that um, aren't found in, let's say, objects that you would pick up or bang around or move. And it could lead into a lot of evaluational troubles. Let's say one of his favorite ones was the word mind and the word you know body. You might mention the word mind and maybe you'd consider something between, you know, your ears, the brain, let's say. And if you talk about a body, maybe the rest of you inside your skin, but not exactly your brain. But you'd never find a living human anywhere with a brain so-called or a mind so-called and no body and vice versa. And so you wouldn't have a whole... Um, operational living person and that has uh, importance later on in our evaluations and evaluational reactions so he's concerned about elementalism and non-elementalism is splitting in language what you're not going to find split if you go out in the world operationally and try to do something show something see something and it's not a trivial uh, distinction So, Laura, does that work for you? Do you? Does that make sense? Does that answer yes. your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very oh. much. Okay. So, use a stomach. You know, a stomach is an interesting example because a stomach is really it's the first part of your nervous system to differentiate itself and as a lining of nerve systems. And so, when we talk about the brain. We actually the brain is the thing in the body, not also the stomach, not the peripheral nervous system, not the way that's extended throughout the whole thing. And so, language keeps carving up, making entities where there's really whole process and relations. Right. So okay. it is a kind of systems or holistic view of things yeah um the next one was multi-ordinal uh we did cover that last time or at least give a preliminary sense of it but uh would someone like to provide a you know reminder of what that refers to do i have to call on somebody <laughs> <laughs> some of the cameras just got turned off yeah <laughs> uh. Can I can I uh, make a contribution? I'm very new to uh, to gender semantics, but I've been re I've been reading for a little a little bit, and from what Corey said last week, uh, is it uh, where it has to be multi uh, ordinal means it had to be considered in context, uh, in in terms of a word doesn't really mean anything unless you put it in context, and so therefore if you said I don't love if it's not in, in proper context, then it doesn't mean anything. So if you said, oh, I love to do certain things, or I uh, I love you, or something in that context, then it has it has meaning. So the idea of multi-ordinal uh, means that it, it, it only exists when you put it the, the, the thing in, in context. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
in, in modern linguistics, you know, to update it from 1933, a lot of people would talk about indexicals. So a word like I or you or this or here or now, those are all indexed. Even pronouns like he and she. Like if I say Jill went to the market, she bought some milk. When I say what does the word she mean, it doesn't mean first person singular feminine. It means Jill. So context is is part of it, and I I believe the ordinal the it refers to order of of abstraction. So something can be on a lower or a higher order of abstracting, and that's determined by by context. Okay, but uh, can you explain how how Jess uh, can be can have different meanings in different contexts? You mean yes, the word yes? Yes, the word yes. Well, it depends on how you define meanings, which is important. People talk about meaning. Maybe they mean words in a dictionary. But for Kozhipsky, meanings with an S has to do, again, with the neuro part of it, the systems, how you react, how you look. So the meanings is not just verbal, what's going on. So if you say... Like he said, do you want to smoke? You'd say yes. Well, the content of that yes would be smoke. You know, do you want to drink? And you'd say yes. Well, what would the content, the, the operational definition of yes be? Well, it would be that drink. So each time you use yes, if you get off of the, let's say, the linguistic aspect of meaning in a dictionary, and you go into the operational definition of meanings, what are you pointing at? What are you doing? What are you getting at? That would be what yes, in that case, would be referring to yes one, yes two, yes three. And each time you would have something else you're operating with, you're using, you're pushing. Perfect. Thank you. I understand. Perfect. What was the third term again? Uh, semantic aphasia, aphasia, aphasia or aphasia? Aphasia. 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 Okay. Um, and he does bring up aphasia, which is a medical term. Um, so, um, any volunteers for, for, I think both aphasia, uh, and Laura, do you know what, are you familiar with aphasia, just plain aphasia? All right, yes. Here. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, okay. Here. Uh, are you familiar with aphasia, the term aphasia? Yes. And what does it mean to you? Like to have a like a problem with um I don't know with your gestures or something like that. Well, I mean it's generally I mean either a, a result of brain damage or mm. or a uh, disability of some sort where that interferes with language the ability to use language um i mean it's often associated with stroke but i mean it, there are other you know causes for that um so i think he's I, I it seems to me he's using that as a metaphor uh for more kind of you know less let's say le less medically produced but more psychological kind of issues uh regarding uh our the way we make meaning or the way we respond to stimuli. Um, but uh, I'll see if anyone else has something to. Yeah. Can I, can I add something? Please. So yeah, there's two, two kind of uh, you, you have a receptive quality to your language. So you, you hear and understand the meaning of words uh, and then you have an expressive quality. So uh, a receptive, aphasia, the inability to understand language um, is a Wernicke's aphasia. So you can, you can hear things, you just can't understand what they are. And you can say things, but you don't necessarily say things uh, or understand the, the meaning of the, the things being said to you. A Broca's aphasia is, um, people, people talk about word salad, where you're producing copious amounts of words, but the uh, syntax of those words together doesn't form a meaningful sentence so 
a, a Broca's aphasia is an expressive aphasia. So a, a semantic aphasia is just a inability to receive and understand the meaning of. So. Thank you very not, much. Perfect. Not a medical diagnosis. It's just a, like like Lance was saying, it's more of a metaphorical statement. I think those are great questions, Laura. I mean, yeah. Thank you. You helped everybody, I think. Yeah, and it's very useful to be able to, you know, and there's a lot of repetition in the book, but as he's pointing out, it's it's kind of necessary because so much of this is unfamiliar. Um, we, uh, yeah. What, one, another unfamiliar, it might be very easy for all of you, but uh, there's this non-identity uh, uh, idea of, he keeps on in the books about, obviously when you say a thing, it's not, is something that's not something. I, I sort of understand that from the level of abstractions, but the idea of that we're building a map and then you give it a label, like Corey brought up a pen last week and it was a pen and it's not the pen, but the word pen, is that not identi identification in itself? Or the map, is not the map by identification? The word what was that? Like pen, we use the word pen. Pen? We, yeah, pen, P-E-N. That is not the word P-E-N, even though it's a map to what's happening in the, in the world, and it's not the thing, but is the word pen not identification in itself? Yeah, or that's... You... Oh, oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. It sort of weaves into what I was going to say. I mean, Lance and I just held up pens, and they were different. But, like, I'm just noticing the nature of the recursiveness in what we're talking about. Um, because when I raised my hand before, it was still on the thing about the negative space being important. And, and we were talking about a, a kind of power dynamic of a teacher and a student in that scenario. And then if you think about in terms of culture and the worlds, we all have these different worlds, um, calling a policeman for help is not a good idea in some situations and neighborhoods. Um, so, um, this, the nature of what we're trying to pin down, it is helpful. You know, I, I'm still like, I'm, I'm, I'm really in this place of scholarship that is elemental and, and, and ones that are more of the Western science lineage. So this dialogue and the tools of language and study, it's all, um, it's moving. Um, okay. I mean, I, I, I'll get the impression that the, the word pen is a pointer to the map that we're making from our extractions, mm -hmm. but, the, but that pointer is itself must be, a, must be an identification. Is that not right? Must be. A, an identification. Mm -hmm. the, word, the word pen that points to the map is that an identity in itself yeah I mean, when Korzybski says the word is not the thing he oh. sort of says you know that this word pen is a kind of mapping for what this is but this what I'm holding is also already a kind of abstraction from my nervous system and to that extent I confuse the word for the thing and the thing for the event and so I think he wants to get us to realize that there are, again, multiple layers and levels at which this is occurring. Okay. I mean, I, I, I sort of got that, but it's, it's, it's the, the labeling. That, in other words, you've got to point to something, but in that pointing, you're identifying, you're, you're getting everyone to move their, their head or whatever in that direction. If that makes any sense. Right, yeah. And, and in a, you know, we say pointing uh as you know like a, a symbol points to an object you know in, in the sense that it means it stands for an object but in a very literal way very young children uh when they're learning language actually pointing is precedes uh language acquisition and it does you know what what it signifies is like when the little child points at something there's a kind of theory of mind going on where it's like we recognize I'm pointing at this 
and you're going to look at it and we're both looking at the same thing. Uh, so it's, you know, in, in a sense, there's the meaning the, the before the symbol itself is there um, when it comes to pointing. Um, so the word pen points to the object which exists, you know, as he puts it on the silent, you know, nonverbal level. It, you know, it exists on the unspeakable. I always think of Lovecraft when he says unspeakable, but, you know, uh, you know, on that kind of level. I know Corey would point this out as well, that Dorothy Lee, the anthropologist, um, goes even further to say that it's not just that the word is not the thing, but the thing is not a thing, except that we have the word for it, or otherwise we wouldn't recognize it as a thing. It yeah. would just be part of the environment. The fact that, you know, in, we talked about art earlier, the, you know, the fact that it's not negative space, that it's figure, not ground, has a lot to do with the fact that we already have the name for it. You know, that thingifies, that makes it into a thing. Um, Dorothy Lee didn't really publish all that much, but, um, uh, um, was it Freedom from Culture, Corey? Was that the name of the group yeah. of essays? Really yeah. uh, worth wor a worthwhile reading. Yeah. Um, the essay is called Symbolization and Value from Freedom and Culture. I just want to maybe say, you know, this, see, the difficulty with saying that this is a, a pencil or say that this is a pen is that when I call it a pen, I bring it into a recognized semantic domain of meaning. Whereas when I call it a plastic item or something cylindrical, or when I say it's a piece of garbage, that it eventually there will be garbage in a landfill longer than it served as a pen. Now I start to open up semantically the way I'm understanding what it is according to the language I'm using. And Corey, I, lo I love that because I just want to bring it back to when I was teaching young children um, in academic settings. So about learning and and where, you know, how we get along together and what we know. And um, it's really easy the kinds of words that are concrete and you can hold up. But if it's uh, someone and you're trying to describe justice, freedom, liberty, um, will, those are much more difficult and situational and personal and yeah. How about in between a word like stranger or friend? See, you can't point to friend or stranger. That is, it's a very abstract, but it, it, it passes in a guise of being a very concrete word, but it's basically a semantic loading that allows you to have an evaluation about someone. Yes, that's right. That's right. And, and by the way, all any negative word, you know, no, not, uh, those are extremely abstract terms. There's nothing you can point to that indicates not or absence. Uh, the, you know, there's, it's sort of like George Lakoff's famous example of, you know, don't think of an elephant. I tried that with my students. You know, it's like, close your eyes and, and do not think of an elephant. And it's impossible, right? And it's, it's impossible to do the negative. Um, which he translates, um, you know, in terms of politics, that that what that uh, means is that when you invoke a frame, uh, even to negate it, even to say it's not true, you're reinforcing the framework, um, which uh, is sort of problematic for folks, uh, especially when they're dealing with, you know, in politics with with uh, others who are always lying and then you're always saying well that's not you know what you said is not true but you're reinforcing it by responding to it um why don't we uh continue on uh terence uh we're hi yeah thanks i'm i'm terence thank you by the way for arranging this this is a really challenging work and it's nice to work through it together mm -hmm. um i wanted to ask about or talk about one of the key concepts in this reading, which was uh, semantic reaction. And I wanted to try to uh, articulate what I understood it to be and see if I'm on the right path and see if others have maybe different understandings. Um, so he mentioned semantic stimulus. So the counterpart would be semantic reaction, but is there kind of a, a generalization going on here? So you could imagine 
uh, a reaction being emotional or a reaction being intellectual or perhaps even physical? And is he trying to, in a way, generalize what's going on in response to this semantic stim stimulus by simply calling it a, a semantic reaction? Yeah, I mean, yes. Somebody want to respond to that? Well, I'm. I mean, I'll throw out yes, <laughs> um, yes in at least one of the meanings. Um, but you know, for me, um, something very a very important source material for Krasinski is Pavlov, and so it's you know it's, it's stimulus response that is the basis of semantic reaction, and it's. Even we even see the same initials there of SR uh, going on that, uh, you know, the Pavlov's dogs are, you know, those are examples of a kind of semantic reaction, but um, one that doesn't involve the kind of processing and delay that he's he's looking for. But it is behavioral. You know, it's rooted in in behaviorism that the idea of semantic reactions and which is rooted in physio physiology. That's the neuro um, part of it. Uh, James, did you are you saying you want to respond to that? Or are you just. I don't know if you're really doing something or not. Um, so I made a few notes on there. I'm not sure if I'm if I'm correct, but I, I've got here where the semantic reactions is a uh, it refers to some sort of a, a response and interpretation of individual how individuals respond to words and symbols, which based on things like their personal experience, knowledge, and the context. W would you say that's correct? Or mm -hmm. Jackie? Yes, I, I would say that's correct. Yes, it's how we respond to. Um, the environment, whether it's a word or an action or an event. Mm -hmm. um, and Korzybski, um puts forth that the more we put the tools of his system into use, the better our reactions will be to any situation. Like if, if, if there's a fire, are we just going to run away or that would be a um, one kind of reaction? Or are we going to think, all right, we have to call the fire department and we it, it thinking about stuff or just responding without thinking. That's mm. the difference between a signal reaction and a symbol reaction. So, um, and, and the more we think about it, the better our reactions would be to any situation. So. Yeah. And, and what Jackie said was so important. It's a response to anything in the environment, which is again, stimulus. Uh, you know, stimulus can be in the form of a word or symbol, or it can be in anything, any kind of information that we take in from the world outside of us. Mm -hmm. And how we process that information. Yeah. And then what yeah. our subsequent reaction would be to it. And in, many times it's, it's very, very important. Um, and that's, you know, again, behaviorism is about uh, adjustment to the environment and how the environment influences us, influences, you know, all organisms' behavior, um, you know, in some way trains us. But that, you know, speaks to the idea that we can, we can learn, you know, behaviorism is also called learning, mm -hmm. uh, and that we can learn and therefore modify our behavior, that it's not say genetically you know it's not just a product of genetics and inborn and and hardwired but we're capable of this learning process i see Corey about to jump in he's getting he looks he looks agitated you look agitated Corey. because i do think yeah pavlov is very interesting in this case so if you take a, a dog and you put it in a cage and you put a divider in the cage and you have above it a bell and then a light and you ring the bell, and then a couple of seconds after that, you flash the light, and then a couple of seconds after that, you send a shock through the bottom of the cage. The dog realizes there's a shock there. Then you teach the dog that you put a little divider in the base of the cage, and you teach the dog that if it jumps to the other side of that little fence, after the, 
bell rings, but before the light flashes, no shock comes. And in, in the learning paradigms, basically, they start ringing the bell, and the dog's going bouncing, they bam, it's bouncing back and forth from the cage. And what's interesting, not only is that you can teach a dog in that reinforcement schedule to avoid the shock by jumping to the other side of the cage, but what happens is, once you remove the electric circuit from the bottom of the cage, the dog never discovers that. You ring the bell and it jumps to the other side and goes, ha ha, look, I avoided the shock. No, the shock hasn't been coming for years, dog. And I, I think that's what gets the point is that people can create what were adaptive responses in some situations. Those situations change. They don't notice it and they continue along action patterns, which were based upon previous kinds of environments and experiences. Mm -hmm. Hence old dogs and new tricks. I think the, <laughs> the metaphor to the Pavlovian behavioralistic uh, um, view of this is, is interesting, but probably more relevant to the physical stimulus, the sensory stimulus, and Korzycki seems to be moving on to the much more challenging um, semantic stimulus. And it's interesting to, to ask, okay, uh, well, if you can't do retraining in the Pavlovian way, what are we talking about in terms of retraining our semantic reactions? And it seems like I mean, if you jump way ahead to current knowledge about um, the way that we think about language, it's tempting to think that we would have to retrain our ontology because uh, the way that I react to a particular word is determined mm -hmm. to a large extent by my ontology. We've mentioned context and we can avoid error by paying attention to context, but that's not something I'm going to change. I mean, I could change in terms of being more attentive, but to really change, to get to the root of a change in uh, semantic reaction, I think you'd have to modify one's ontology. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, travel is very important. Well, I think that, you know, that's Korzybski's project is to, uh, yeah. Corey, what did you say? What is important? Travel. Oh, okay. I think travel allows you to go away, come back, and see your own residence with new eyes. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. If you go back to the example I gave with the dog, the only way to get the dog out of its uh, belief, as it were, that it's escaping the punishment is to ring the bell and hold the dog down. And then the dog realizes that the shock isn't coming. So some of these strategies that Korzybski has are one of frustrating people's normal responses to get them show that they're actually maladapted. The, the, I mean, conditioned behavior will extinguish over time, you, you know, unless the stimulus is reapplied and the, um, the contingencies are sort of re-evoked. And, and partly because there's a randomness to occurrence, right? There, there are accidental fallings onto the plate and when the light goes off and, the, and there's a, it's just a sort of random occurrence that um, interrupts that, that sort of uh, conditioned uh, state. But human beings have an internal context that allows us to continue to replay and recondition ourselves to the stimulus that is provoked from a word because we can keep saying the word. So we don't need an external conditioning context. We have, an, we have a ready set internally conditioned context, which is uh, t tends to grow, but it never shrinks. I, I love that point, Ernest, but I'm also remembering a story I received once about um, a family who in their family, the culture was we only wear white socks and generation of gener after generation, they were really, they only wore white socks. And then one of them, one of the kids wore black socks. This was not that long ago, maybe 20 years ago. And they said, what are you doing? And they found out that the reason they wore white socks was that the dyes in darker colors when the immigrant family came over weren't set and they would bleed. And so there was the culture and the genealogy and the technology at play too. I mean, there's just so many contexts all the time. And, and and that's like, and that's where you put things like tradition and mythos and all of these things that um, kind of uh, reference, it, it treats today as if it were yesterday. 
and there's a uh, sort of assumption of continuity between today and yesterday that as things were, you know, as things are today, so shall they be tomorrow. And that that concept of a constantly changing process that I'm a process that's constantly evolving and the world is a process that's constantly evolving. And so this idea of rechecking by wearing black socks every few generations, right, ends up being more um, functionally useful. That's why I don't have the can of cranberry sauce at Thanksgiving anymore. We have fresh cranberry sauce. Um, because that other stuff doesn't taste very good, even though it's a tradition. Hey, um, Laura, you're next in line. Uh, thank you very much, Lance. Um, when you were talking about the, the word no and the definition or the understanding we have uh, about this word, I um, remembered the um, uh, one term uh, of Korsivsky, which is unspeakable. So can we say that uh, this word or these terms like no, or maybe the metaphysical terms like potentiality, act, um, um, are related with, the, with this term, with unspeakable, or when we, when we talk about unspeakable, we we only speak about feelings. I, I'd say not just feelings, but and there is a sense of feelings as opposed to named emotions are something outside of the linguistic or as realm, but um, just the physical reality, material reality, things that are go beyond what we can uh, describe in language or experience through language are unspeakable. Uh, sort of like Wittgenstein, whereof we cannot speak, thereof we must remain silent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Will. Yes, thank you. Um, in chapter two, I believe it was on page 31, 32, something like this, uh, he starts talking about semantic hygiene which I thought was a really interesting concept. Uh, he actually mentioned the word mental health as well. And of course, that's a, it's a big part of our culture in North America right now. Uh, and I'm, I'm just like, was going through this. And Lance, you mentioned something at the beginning of this session uh, that semantic is uh, more of an eclectic term or holistic term that involves symbolism and that it's not just language itself because when i was reading semantic hygiene i was thinking something along the lines of like narrative therapy in a sense where we are uh trying to change or cognitive therapy where we're trying to change our language to uh start to fit our experience better um but if i was wondering if you or if anyone else could speak more to how we could achieve uh, a semantic hygiene in the, in the sense of what he's what he's going for Somehow I just thought of brainwashing <laughs> as hy yeah. hygiene, but uh, hygiene. <laughs> <Watch it. laughs> which, you know, I mean, this is part of the unfortunate language of this time as well, because um, on the other side, you know, you had the Nazis talking about racial hygiene, um, but that was just, you know, and then again, I mean, as late as my own time in, in junior high school, we had a class called hygiene. Mm -hmm. um, so uh it's but uh but yeah i mean it, it we're going back to the reactions rather than the uh um the use of rather than the terms themselves rather than the language or symbols um but maybe someone else wants to speak to that i, I do think hygiene was a word of the times um much more means so much differently to us today but um but I think he, he meant that we should um, have our semantic reactions as clean as possible, as clear as possible, and work hard hard towards that. But because I think of uh, when my son was a teenager and we were the hangout place in the basement and all the language that would come up the stairs. And I would just say, keep it clean down there, you know, you know be like verbal hygiene coming from the basement. But um 
just the words they were using, but I don't think that's what um, Krasinski meant. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it seems like the. I'm glad. Thank you for, by the way, for citing page numbers because that's really helpful. Um, and that whole passage is, you know, he's referring to mental health, mental ills, mental hygiene, and, and all of that. So, and and a part of his argument is that a lot of what are considered, you know, mental problems, psychological problems, are semantic problems, and therefore can be addressed through semantic means. And it's really what he's putting forth. And and I don't remember, you know, it, it's amazing in a book this size, it's really hard to focus on everything. And so I don't remember in previous readings seeing the kind of disclaimer that I noticed this time where, where he does say that what he's proposing does not um, really uh, address certain mental issues, uh, um, which in his time, something like schizophrenia, even in Bateson's time, was not understood as a physiological problem. But clearly, he, you know, he's aware that there are physiological um, issue problems related to mental health that uh, are need to be addressed differently, but that um, a lot of these, you know, and I, I think we could probably categorize them in Freudian terms as the difference between neurosis and psychosis, that mm -hmm. this isn't going to solve psycho psychotic uh, problems, but a lot of neuroses can be addressed through semantic health, if you like, or or hygiene, or and you know, in a much later time, Postman used semantic environment and talked about polluting the semantic environment. Mm -hmm. They're kind of equivalent ideas. Lewis, but, uh, or you, uh, Jack, did you want to just add something? I'm sorry. Um, but we need to remember that Krasinski did much of his research in the mental health field, in mm -hmm. insane asylums, as they were called then, and it was a, an interest of, of his very much. So... A lot of his thinking comes out of that world too. Yeah. Okay. Lewis. Yeah, uh, kind of plays off the point Will made, but on page 32 and the top of 33, it says um, the reader should notice that the use of a language of a new structure has led to new results, which in turn directly affect our semantic reaction. And I was curious if the main emphasis on general semantics is more cognitive like with the extensional devices kind of reframing our language or how we interpret that and kind of like a delay as far as like awareness of that and then kind of similar to um changing our language like in rational mode of behavior therapy of more like rational beliefs and those devices being more like if that's the emphasis of general semantics is using our um language different to influence our reactions. Mm -hmm. I would say yes, to have more sane reactions. I think that was yeah. the, mm -hmm. the whole purpose of it. Okay. Yeah, you, sanity, to, to react more sanely to, to, to the world. Mm -hmm. Because I like mentioning like the behaviorism and like the Pavlov. I'm curious, like, you know, if that is more just like as a education around how our semantic reactions occur, or if like Korzybski also thought of more of beyond just the cognitive um, devices being used, because that is in a sense, um, it's behaviorism, but it's more not. Lewis, you, you mentioned last week, acceptance and commitment therapy. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So these these uh, these devices that Korbitsky, um offers up are effectively analogous to uh, cognitive diffusion strategies. Yeah, it's about being able to notice the th that I'm thinking, or notice the thought, notice that I'm thinking, notice that I am the thinker, right? Uh, and I'm not the thought to be able to take a step back. Hmm. Okay. That's the effect of analog. Yeah, yeah, and I, I see that actually very, uh, very clearly. I read this. That's interesting. It's a matter of translation there. Mm -hmm, I like uh, it. It's good. Uh, I I will note because you mentioned behaviorism that this is you know of course when you get from Pavlov to Skinner, they 
treat the mind as the black box and this is not that kind of behaviorism you know and that that was you know a fundamental error on skinner's part um and that this is closer and in a sense i i gave a talk about this at the uh recent symposium that you know can see the behaviorism of george herbert mead and symbolic interaction as looking at thought as behavior you know then and that's really you know korzybski is uh getting at the very same idea that it's it's neurological it is something physical it's not it's not a black box uh that we have to just set aside and not deal with and all, also non-intentional mm -hmm. okay uh jason hello can you hear me mm -hmm. thank you as i too uh and focus on the basics, trying to keep things simple. And uh, as far as the terminology and meanings chapter, of course, this goes into structure, the word structure. And uh, um, when I th first think of the meaning of the word structure, um, I want to think of it as the word context, but here I see in this chapter, Korzybski uses the word context, and so they don't seem the same. So I was one first. My first question was whether someone can perhaps uh, uh, differentiate between the two for me, please. And then, uh, secondly, um, on page twenty nine, uh, Korzybski talks about structure, says. Uh, in fact, because the objective levels are not words, the only possible aim of science is to discover structure, which he has in italics, which when formulated, always simple and easily understood by everyone, with the exception, of course, of very pathological individuals. <laughs> and then we've already seen that structures be considered as a configura configuration of relations, and that relations appear as the essential factors in meanings and so of uh, semantic reactions. And so my understanding, uh, and then lastly, uh, Korzybski, he, on the next page, 31, he talks about structure and he first mentions that he, he says, uh, all the issues involved in the present work are of necessity interconnected. Thus, order leads to relational, or order leads to relations, relations to structure, and these in turn to non L meanings and evaluations, which are the fundamental factors of all psychological states and responses, called more specifically semantic reactions. So he seems to tie it all up there as well. And, and for that particular paragraph, I was hoping for maybe an, a simple example. Thank you. Well, uh, somebody want to? I mean, I think the simplest example that he has, it's, it's in various places where he's talking about something like there's New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, and that the object of our knowledge is structural relations rather than some things that are there independent and depending on how well we're mapping we were always we're always going to have new york over to the east side and then chicago is going to be a little bit to the west and then san francisco is going to be the west and so in that sense it's like that we have um again maladapted maps and semantic reactions that are inappropriate to our context if we don't have the structure right sure i see the uh order relations structure and then like and then yes wraps it all up then into a possible semantic reaction i think uh, jason wanted an example more like how could you put that in the real world somehow? Um, I, I I like the map uh, I mean, analogy. I, I I'll you know Jason. Let me 
get to the to your first question because I think that was a good one, and I think your initial instinct was was um, proper that context and structure are very similar concepts, and uh, it really can be grouped together. And so, if you want to um, tease out a distinction, context tends to largely be understood as something external to what we're dealing with, you know, whatever the object of study is, where structure, we're talking more about something internal to it. Um, although that is elementalistic to make that kind of distinction, which is why ultimately we're talking about the same kind of thing. Uh, but that, uh, and, and we can also see again, going back to source material that, you know, he's kind of uh, very much inspired by Einstein. And what does Einstein say with the theory of relativity is that there is no absolutes there. There are only relations, but relations are the objective reality. Um, you know, that that is really, you know, key. And so what we can know, you know, and what we can understand about anything is its structure uh, rather than, if you like, its content or, or its you know absolute absolute quality, um, and so structure for him becomes this key term. So we're talking you know, you know where we get the structural differential um, uh, of things. So and and as Corey illustrate you know used that. Korzybski's illustration. I mean, it, it does involve order. Interestingly enough, by the way, if you follow the theory of relativity, that doesn't work for quite so well. Um, that you can't, you know, that that the order of things in space depends on on your position in space, and uh, you know that there's conceivably a place where you could be where it goes Chicago, New York. What was the third one again? I forgot. San Francisco. San Francisco, not to mention, depending on the kind of flight that you book, uh, you could wind up uh, going that way. But it's also true, and I, and I still, I, I cannot wrap my head around this, but that the order in time of things, the sequence in time changes to, uh, according to the theory of relativity. So where we see event one followed by event two from a different position in space, event two would happen before event one. And I'm still trying to trying to internalize that one. But but again, I mean, I think that, you know, that's really, the, you know, the key is, you know, for him is to look at the structure of things rather than uh, things like a kind of absolute um, in isolated um object or or thing or um if if that i don't know if that really Can i just follow that up real quickly lance yeah. and I think it's really right for, from my perspective it was really right to invoke the structural differential there if we go back to the pen example that we've been making reference to i mean i think this is what Korzybski is sort of saying, like as a concrete illustration, as Jackie was saying, what, what's a concrete example? Well, if we don't get the what he calls the order of evaluation proper, if we don't start with the event, but if we start instead with the object, or even worse, if we start with the word, then we can get very confused about our relationships to things. Like we may not realize that what looks like a solid object actually is shedding microparticulate plastic material and that it's it has a physical consequence. Like, like the invention of plastics and our not really, you know, our failure to realize that plastics are actually complicated events that aren't really, you know, self-contained entities, but they're they're a kind of an event level where we've we you know turn things like convenience. And, you know, the, the words that we use for plastics, those have come to the forefront and then the plastic themselves are even less. And then the, the reality of plastics as an event gets even further pushed. And so the failure to you know evaluate, right, is the failed structure. Or be like an example. Ah, uh, taken as a whole. I, I think it's just, you know, when it comes to the map is not the territory, you know, the key thing is, well, what's the relationship between map and territory? What's the relationship between language and its and what it refers to or perception and and what's out there? And it's a structural relationship, right? That it's the word is not the thing, but, 
in, in a proper use of language, the words will be structurally similar to the things out there. Um, someone last time brought up the uh, Maturana and Varela and the Tree of Knowledge, and they, they use the term structural coupling, um, which seems to me straight out of Korzybski, although they don't re uh, acknowledge it. But it is that similarity in structure is what he's pointing to, because we don't actually see the world as it is, but what well, you know, our perception has to have a structural similarity to the world in order for us to work in the world, you know, in order for us to be able to do things. Thank you. Okay, uh, Phil, you're up next. Yeah, um, back to structure and uh, let's see, mental hygiene. You know, we live in a world where people talk a lot and they'll make claims. There was, there was a football, I'll, I'll be apolitical. There was a football game yesterday and some people could say, oh, the game was stolen, right? Well, should I adopt that or should I, does that, does that map that someone wants me to adopt, does that map match the territory? Well, something, to have something be stolen has to mean something in, in reality. You know, you, so you'd have to look at the lower levels of abstraction to see if that actually is the case. So, you know, I think it tells us we can be inoculated. I, I think the word comes in this book, we can be inoculated from other people's bullshit. We don't have to adopt other people's maps mm -hmm. just because they say something. You know, how much does their map match, you know, the territory in, in this case? And, yeah. I, and I don't think it's so much stress so, so much in a book, but I did find this one piece in the front matter and I thought it was important. It says, like some animals that can outwit humans because of their keen observations, the cunning, often pathological, thoroughly ignorant present day totalitarian leaders are not unaware of the academic shortcomings based on inertia, verbalisms, etc., and openly proceed to utilize these human nervous weaknesses destructively and very telling results. And I kind of see general semantics as mental hygiene, a way of inoculating yourself from bullshit or a, a baloney detection kit. Mm -hmm. Great point. Uh, Tiffany? There's something, so it's related to all of this, and I think I, I'm in the boat where a lot of what I'm focusing in on is the language that he chooses and struggling with the context of it. So he talks about copying animals. And then, yes, and then, you know, it was, I, I thought that I got it, but then as I read on, he would mention it again and it would not make sense to me. And then he has a whole section. I don't understand, am I, is this, is, is he literally saying that, I don't understand it, it's lost on me. Is it a literal meaning that we copy animals or what's, what is the broader context of him making this, this, I don't want to say concepts, but formula, he would say, what, what is the point? What, what are we supposed to get from this? <laughs> Could I try that one? Please, please. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess his biggest point, do you have a, could you see the structural differential from where you are, Tiffany? I took a class, and so I understand a little bit about it. Like, well, I'm just wondering if you had a picture of it. I could anywhere. pull one up really quick, yeah. Yeah, because what he was getting to about copying and not copying animals is that, Humans and animals both abstract. You know, humans and animals do have events. They do have objects. Animals can react to the objects. But animals cannot know that their objects are not the world. You need science to, to get to the point that what we're seeing, hearing, and tasting is not the world out there. So if we copy animals, we stop abstracting somewhere. We might have one abstraction, two, three, ten, but we can become conscious of abstracting. How would you explain to an animal that what goes on inside of them, the dinner they see, the smells they have, you know, the reproducing they do with their kind is not the world outside of themselves. How could you explain that to an animal to get them conscious of abstracting? If we stop, we don't 
reach that point. The animals do stop, and if humans stop, we're eliminating the possibility of, of doing that. So he, he meant it was not healthy or detrimental to copy animals, in other words, to stop abstracting, to not becoming conscious of Jeff, abstracting. Maybe Tiffany's question is more along the lines, though, are we, you know, literally copying what animals do? You know, is what when he's using well, that that word copying as opposed to just behaving as in the same way as animals um well, is this you what know, was he asking hmm? no i asked her what was she intending did i miss her yeah. point yeah i'm just wondering if 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 that was the point about you know the use of the term copying in in, in this context yeah i i think it's more along what you're saying lance so he goes in section C, he goes and says, he, he's trying to justify why he uses the term copying when he says, um, what does he say? It's standard meaning implies reproduction after a model. And so, I, yeah, that's, it's really, I'm getting hung up on it. And I also, I'm, I thought that in some place he actually said that we do copy animals. So that's what I'm struggling with. If we, I don't understand the order of it. I don't understand why that language choice specifically. <laughs> Real quickly to come at it, Tiffany, it sort of follows. I thought Jeff's explanation really worked for me. I mean, I, that makes perfect sense, especially on the structural differential. But you might come at it with Kozhipsky wants to say, look, we're not just space binders, we're time binders. And we're copying ourselves in our politics and in our understanding when we think that we're just like animals in space competing for resources, not realizing that we're all in the wake of the living, the work of the living dead, which is the cultural history. And that qualitatively makes us very other than animal. And we cover over that fact and make it seem as if this sort of stab and grab individualistic, uh, you know, the, again, the way that an animal would fight for territory is a proper kind of set of responses for the human. And I think he wants to critique that. You know, I think I found the uh, the part that you're talking about. I and I have a fourth edition, so I apologize. It may be on a different page, but page eight, uh, second paragraph, the functioning of the human nervous system is a more generalized affair than that of the animal with more possibilities. The latter is the special case of the former, but not vice versa. John Smith, through ignorance of the mechanism, may use his nervous system as a phyto, but Fido cannot copy Smith, hence the danger for Smith, but not for Fido. Um, and, and just, you know, my, my takeaway, I'm, I'm no expert on that, but my takeaway is that um, you have an obligation by virtue of having a human nervous system to function at a higher level than, you know, yeah. a dog could. When did I, Johnson I, help help me understand this a bit? And but I, said, I think uh, you know the point about not acting like animals is just it. That's not the issue there at all. Here, you know that that part is very clear. Um, you know, and again, it, it's the, the particular use of the term copying, which implies not just that you're acting like an animal, but that you are you are imitating an animal. And uh, and it seems like uh, to you know to for the most part, that's not his intention, uh, as far as you know what folks are saying. Um, you know, so you know, just to you know not get bogged down in in, in this, um, you know, since our time is is running out. Um, you know, the, I think there the, and and there are actual theories that came later, like for example, that human beings imitated dogs after they were domesticated. And that, that formed some of our ideas about military, um, you know, about the military, which is where you get dogs of war. I mean, there actually are theories that of literal copying of of animals, but it doesn't seem like that's really what Korzybski was was saying. Um, and it could just be, you know, a problematic word uh, word usage that um, that's come up uh, partly for him not being a native speaker. Sorry, can I just interject there very quickly? So he he does mention things about that. It's not copying, but he was say he was saying things on the terms of when we call ourselves that we we take after animals. So in other words, he was saying that we've got to move away from the uh, elementary, you know, uh, reductionism, 
uh, and using those those phrases that uh, we're like animals, you'll say we should change our language because it, it oversimplifies things as opposed to right. using our non-elementary ideas, which gives a holistic perspective. So we'll say that animals work on signals and we work on symbols. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but again, I mean that that wasn't the question that was raised, and I think that you know we, we've this has been stated several times already that you know Korzybski is saying that we shouldn't behave like like animals. So, I, I think we I think we could move on to. Uh, Can I just say that I mean in this actual passage that is section C that finishes up the the chapter terminology and meanings it really is very clearly what jeff had said i mean he says but for our present purposes the most important form of the copy of animals was and is the copy of the comparative unconditionality of the condition reflexes or lower order of conditionality the animalistic identification or confusion of orders of abstraction and the lack of consciousness of abstracting i mean i think he literally i mean jeff had it for me it was like a bullseye Right, but that wasn't Tiffany's question, Corey. Because that's that passage still doesn't 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 refer to imitating, you know, li, you know, watching what an animal is doing, that's and, then, and then going out and doing the same thing, which is which is this is the point of confusion. There's more in manhood of humanity. I will be honest when he's when he's talking about wealth and how humans have wealth and other animals don't, and it's what I mean, they don't. Yes, but you keep. I, I'm. I'm just saying. Let's stop this because that point has been made over and over again. Addressing what Tiffany was asking, as I understood the question. But it's not. She was asking. Uh, she was asking about the specific word copying. I think that's what he means. What Jeff said. Okay. Right, and and that's the point. Okay, but that was that's not why what she was asking why she's why he's using the word copying and again it, it's just created a certain confusion when you when we understand copying to mean direct imitation rather than acting like animals so let, let's just tiffany am i right I actually, you know, I'm thinking this would be a really good topic to to investigate further and trace through his work. <laughs> so I yeah, I, I still am hung up on, like you said, the actual cho choice of the term copy. I, I don't understand. I understand the idea of what he's trying to say, which is that, you know, we what makes I like the so I, what I didn't understand that Corey contributed was that we are copying animals in the sense that of the time binding version so we we create um we copy ourselves but i don't understand why he chooses the word copy when referencing our relationship to animals i don't see how we directly imitate animals um and on in intent with any type of intentionality and I, I it would give i just don't see that within the context of his work fitting i don't i'm not understanding it so th <laughs> understanding it as a, a language choice that may not have been what he was intending is helpful um like when Jeff pointed you to the structural differential, notice the structural differential angst, and then there's the animal object on the side. But yeah, you... Jeff just went over this, Corey. So I'm just saying, you know, that's not what the question was. I think I know what you might have been after, Tiffany, is that we do not intentionally copy animals. He was making the point that this is unintentional, unconscious habitual that's at least my understanding that there is not the intentional copying of animals and that's where the trouble lies but i don't understand how we would copy animals in the first place when our behaviors are just natural so the types of things that animals do that humans do i don't understand why it would be copying in the sense that it would come first in animals and then second to us it's metaphorical i mean let's generalize and just use copying as a metaphor yeah, it just means acting like. Yeah, just metaphorical. Like reflecting the behavior of animals. Or, yeah. Yeah, just a reflection or, or similarity. Yeah, copying so, is the problem word. Yeah, yeah. put an index on it. So, copying one and copying two. So do we have three. another? I, I know there were some hands up before, and, uh, you know, I think we have time for one more question, you know, one more 
question or one more topic. We really actually kind of burnt through that time with this, but. I know Lenny had a hand up. Are you gone? Okay, I'll say something different then. Um, just the thought that crossed my mind when I was reading uh, about how Korzybski sees the meaning as a much, much wider than the definition of things and trying to see human being as a whole. And, and cross my mind uh, that in linguistics, I, I think he, he was a forerunner because he, he saw how important the, um, uh, the environment is, the situation around things is. And there is a term in linguistics which is called situation and situation, situationality, if I pronounce it right. When in a text you, you study how the things happens uh, in reverse, how the situation and the feelings and of the heroes, for instance, are um, influencing uh, the language used. Uh, for instance, uh, in where where the hero is uh, suffering, uh, how, I mean, how the situation is um, influencing the syntax and the morphology of the language. And for instance, when, when the hero is suffering, a more pass passive voice is used. And when there is a action, there's more active voice used. So um, that's what crossed my mind that is, is very important. And then linguistics uh, do the other way around. They studied how the situation uh, uh, influence language in a context. In uh, that's what I want to say. Okay. Uh, sounds like uh, pragmatics. Yes, a bit. <laughs> um, someone like to comment on that or? Corey, you looked like you wanted to say something. No, it's easy to say for him. Well, okay. Uh, any last words? Anyone? Thank you to everyone. Will, oh, you? Great. I mentioned something just going forward. I've always found helpful for these meetings. Voluntarily, if anyone wanted to share their email address for us in the chat so we could communicate outside of um, the chat, and it's only voluntary and so forth, but just if this 90 minutes every week doesn't have to be the only sort of communication because people have said things I'd like to communicate with it and speak more about if you're interested. So I'm, I'm not sure how. Um, you would do that, you know, my well, uh, host. You can, it, it's useful to do that. You you certainly can put your email in the chat and and uh, I'll do and that. Others too. Yeah, anybody the... could write to me and do what yeah. do what they want, but uh, it's helpful to okay. continue this outside of class. You know, if um, you wanted to. Okay, uh, Will. Yes, uh, thank you, Lance. Uh, I just I wanted to bring up this one point that I think comes up in, in part, like the next part, and unfortunately, I won't be here next week, but I, I think it was really interesting. Um, I believe it's on page 47. Uh, he says, for this author and the, the present work must not be held responsible. The fault will lie in the disregard of fundamental conditions by the reader or the students. So what, he, so what he's going that for is here, part just, of this, that is part of this week's reading but oh is it okay great yeah. yeah so i wasn't sure if that was this week or next week um, yeah and and i've seen this come up in other uh occult studies in magical <laughs> studies they say basically well if it doesn't work it's really on you uh it's, it's not because there's a problem with the work itself and my 
and so this is my one criticism of his work is like, well, if it doesn't work for me, then I'm the problem. However, I will say that my only contradiction here in myself is that I have found this to work uh, for me. So, so I, so it's a, it, but it's just, it's a one thing that comes up and I wonder how others who may not find the benefits of this work, uh, how we could approach, how we could approach that, that idea, you know. They need to try harder. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just not enough well, training. Gotta just keep hitting it. <laughs> well, I, I love that and the alchemy, right? And yeah. and the heroes, you know, we were talking about positionality and who's the hero in the story of uh Goldilocks and the three bears or whatever that's on my mind because I'm thinking about buying three bear costumes for my little grandchildren. Anyway, um uh I I love that idea of us, and maybe this would be burdensome for for some folks. But if we maybe start a Google Doc and post things um, and share, Scott says yes. Um, if we share things that come up, because it's just like where you're heading, where I'm really interested into, like um, color as a language or our reactions to color without getting real psychological and stuff, but um, just kind of opening it up because we're finding how Lance and Corey, you reminded me of my, you know, I mean, I will bring it back to my grandkids again, how they wrestle. And, and it's this close relationship. We get to hear you wrestling because we know your relationship and your respect and love for each other and for the topic. So it's fun. And it's it's um it's really rich. This this session and and your offering is so rich. So yeah, I I, I don't want it to become homework because if you tell me to do homework, I won't. It's that no concept, you know. <laughs> don't oh. <laughs> so anyway, thanks a lot. Sure. Sure. Uh, I thought I saw someone else, or maybe not. Uh, okay. Uh, well, this is all great, and uh, you know we can certainly. You now, what I would suggest is that uh, maybe we hold off on that and go and do the reading group, and then as a, a, you know at the conclusion of it that we can set something up. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, yes, Scott. I suggest we do the Google Doc now. There's just so much in these chapters, and 900 pages later, eight weeks later, it's going to be hard to remember. I think uh -huh. that was a great idea Lisa had. Okay. Just. All right. Um, so I'll. Uh, in any event, uh, our our time is up at this point. So I'm going to uh, <clears throat> thank you all for coming and for your participation, and uh, you know. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you again in one week's time uh, as we continue our long march through through the magnum opus. Thank see you, you all Lance. There. Could you give us a few minutes? Thank People you. are still typing email addresses. I could sure. organize them and send them. Yeah, I don't have to close. Yeah, I don't have to close this yet. Uh, yeah, leave the chat open to. But. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Well, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. All right. Adios. Okay. Hold on. Wait. I need That's... to copy the chat so I can have the addresses. And, yeah, um... I assume you have mine since everything. Yeah. <laughs> Well, do I have your permission to give yours to to others? My my email address is publicly available. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, as is most academics are, you know, on their school's website anyway. So, for better or worse, I guess. It's yeah. how we got here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it is. I have a doctor's okay. appointment next week, so I don't think I can make it. But um, can do? Would you mind? sending me a link to the recording lance yeah i haven't had a chance to to put them up yet mm -hmm. um so. i might i might join from the car and just be driving and listening so thank you okay okay well thanks Bye.
Thanks, Thanks. guys. Bye. Thanks. I'm gonna go. Bye. Okay. You all set, Jeff? Yeah. And if I could find out how to allow um, pictures in the chat, I'll let yeah. you know. Because okay. I thought it would be amusing. I had the French painting, this is not a pipe, and I just wanted to put it in the chat, but I couldn't do sure. it. We can always put the link in the chat, but I, I don't know. I could, I looked around. I couldn't find it. Yeah. Oh, if I do, anyway, I'll, I'll send you a note. All right. I'm going to sign off now. Have so. a good night. Yes. So long.